But I think one, one of the things that, that faith brings us to is, and we were talking about it when we were in the, in the chapel in, in the friary, is that when we look at the cross, and it's, it's very Catholic, is that we always see Jesus there, that the corpus is there. And because you talk about in, in your chapter about what does it look like to transcend suffering? And, and what does that individual look like? And in some ways, our, our businesses are similar, right? People are bringing their brokenness to you, and they bring their bro brokenness to me. But I believe in a God that, that can transform that. So I was asking myself, well, what does that look like? And, and, and I recall a, a priest that I met in Africa, and, and I believe what he had was Lou Gehrig's disease. So by the time I met him, he was no longer... Uh, able to really move his arms or legs very well. And we were praying that the Lord would heal him in that. And then he began to share his story with me and, and what had taken place in he and his community in the midst of his sickness, in the midst of his suffering. Was he said, people didn't used to go to church very much, but since I've been sick, people are coming. And that they wouldn't line up for confessions, but since I've been sick, there's a long line of people coming to confession. He said the church was half full and now it's packed. Hmm. He said, people begin to speak and they say that I'm more empathetic, that I'm more compassionate, that I'm more loving, that I'm more kind. And I'm embarrassed to admit that at that moment as he was sharing his story about the transformation that was taken both in he and in the community, I was praying, Lord, please don't heal him. Mm -hmm. Because if we believe that, that, that this is what I want to be, right? I want to be loving and I want to be kind and I want to be generous and I want to be empathetic. But I don't want it to be through the cross. There's got to be another way that we can discover that. Wouldn't that so be nice? wouldn't it though, right? But the fundamental key to the central Christian reality is it's through that cross that we are transformed. It's, it's by, one of the things I was reflecting on, Jesus embraces his cross, his suffering, and says yes to that. A yes, which I, I just can't and Mary imagine. Mary says yes to it too. Yes, right? yes. It, she it, offers That's the question that I want to talk about is yeah. which is more difficult for he to see Hey, his, good yeah. question. Thank you. I'd rather not just a second. either. Good question. Thank you very much. I think we're done. Thank you for coming. <laughs> right? But, but, but isn't, that, isn't that in fact the case? Is that when Jesus embraced his suffering, he gives life to the world. He, he breaks the power over this evil one, over the snake, and gives life suffering is no longer meaning, meaningless, actually it's salvific. But the same thing happened with this priest in this community in, in Nairobi, Africa, is that he embraced the suffering and it transformed him, yes, but it also transformed the community around him because they saw the way and the manner with which he, he suffered. And he embraced that and he found that to be transformative. Isn't that what it means when you talk about transcending this? And you talk about how the impact that that can have on another person watching. That's that's what the invitation, that's what the gospel is inviting us to. Yeah, that seems right to me. Okay, so how do you reconcile this? Thank you. What, another well, point. Reconcile, this is going them, great. reconcile them in what well, 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 so, what so you tell the story, and, and you tell the story beautifully of the passion and the resurrection, but how do, you, how do you personally approach that? How do you reconcile this reality? I think that's what you try to do in your life. You know, I mean, this is an idea that, that I derived I would say in large part from reading Jung, Carl Jung, he talked about psychologically again about the two great ideas about Christ. You know, there's the idea in John and that Christ is the word that was there at the beginning of time and at the end of time. It's this temporally eternal divine word, impersonal in some sense almost. Um, what do you mean by that? Impersonal? Well, because it's something that extends from the beginning of time to the end of time isn't so evidently human, you know? It's, it, it's, it's elevated beyond the confines of what's merely human. But it lacks something as a consequence of that too, right? It lacks time and place. Yeah. And the way Christianity... The nature of the incarnation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It bridges that gap. I had a student once who asked me, why don't we just tell the same archetypal story over and over? Why do we need all these variations? And I thought, that's a really good question. I'm not exactly sure about that. And then I thought, oh, it's related to this issue, is that there's the divine word, but there's the incarnation. And the incarnation indicates that the specifics of time and place are just as important as the, eterni as the eternal that surrounds it. And so then I would say, well, that's probably true in each of our lives, is that, well, how do we reconcile this? And well, that's your, that's your ethical adventure, how you reconcile that. And we, we each do it in our own way and with tremendous difficulty, I would say. And we do it aided and abetted if we're fortunate by people that love and care for us. But that is the challenge, you know, a, a huge part of the challenge of life. 
and this is something I tried to concentrate on in this last chapter, is how do you bear the suffering that is at the crux of life without becoming tempted and embittered? That's really, really difficult. Now, you know, someone might point out, go ahead and be bitter, see where that gets you. And if you have any sense, and generally people have at least some, they know that being sick and bitter is worse than just being sick. And that being, right, it's worse. But it's very hard temptation to avoid. Sometimes you want to be bitter just out of spite, in some sense, because things are so terrible, all you've got left is your willingness to shake your fist, you know, and say, wow, you know, really? Is this, like, this many poisonous snakes? Really? That's, like, maybe I could have learned with just one or two, not a hundred. And so, but we're stuck, we're all stuck with that. And I think we're stuck with it at every level of our life, in some sense, is how do we maintain a high order moral orientation in spite of suffering and malevolence? Yeah, I, when I was a young seminarian, um, one of the things that I struggled with, I worked in a neonatal intensive care. In this summer, I baptized over 20 babies and all the babies died. And it, it was very, I was a seminarian, I was supposed to have all the answers, right? And, the, and they'd come to me and they'd say, you know, tell me real quick, why did this happen? You know, this, this God, why did he allow this to happen? And I came to the place, a couple things. One is that I didn't have to, I didn't have to defend God. Like in my own mind, in my own heart, there was something very freeing in that. I don't know why. I mean, what, what kind of explanation? Let me explain to you why this happened. Oh, well, thank you so much, right, brother. Yeah, right, that makes yeah, sense. I wish right, somebody right. would have told me that, yeah, right? right? But what I did, but, but what I would continually come to is that, and this is a mystery of the faith, that Jesus is present in the midst of the suffering. And I, I tell this, I, actually, the first book I wrote was on freedom. And, and I spent a lot of time in that Exodus text because that's, the, the invitation to look at Pharaoh and be freed and that, but that, that when we're children and, and we fall down and we scrape our knee, our mom comes and she kisses us and she pats us on the head and said, it's going to be okay. And it is. I mean, really, what has she done? She's, she's kissed me on the head and she's patted me and she said, it's going to be okay. But we grow up and we don't think that's enough anymore. But my experience tells me is that when when Christ can do that for me, in the midst of my brokenness, in the midst of my suffering, in the midst of my pain, it remind me that I'm loved, right? I remember sitting in the chapel, it was a Thursday evening as a seminarian, trying to figure all this out and hearing the Lord breaking in the midst of that and say, Dave, I love you. And I said, well, I appreciate that, but that's not the issue. Let me explain the issue. What am I supposed to tell these people? And he reminds me that I'm loved. And, and it's enough. It's enough. And that's, it's the Christian mystery of suffering, that, that it ought not be something that we try to escape, but it's actually an invitation that we continually find Jesus. Because I suggest that when we find God in the presence of the suffering, we can find him anywhere. It's, it's easy to find him in a sunset or in a baptism. Take a, a brand new baby, pour oil all over him and grease him up, and it smells the chrism. It's wonderful. It's easy to find him in that. How about, how about cancer yeah, how and about divorce? That? And infertility, that when we can find, and that it's the mystery of our faith that God enters the messiness. Rather than just fixing it from the outside, he enters this and, and takes this upon himself and transforms it. When we find him there, I suggest we find him anywhere. It's, my experience is that our faith becomes more real, it becomes more authentic, it becomes more present when, when we can find him in the midst of that. Yeah, well, that... that what would I say about that? Well, I guess one of the things I would say about that is that perhaps it looks like, you know, we have something difficult to do, as it turns out. You know, we might think, and why wouldn't we, that we would rather that things were easy and pain-free and fair enough. But... That isn't what our life is like. It's extremely difficult. It's difficult to maintain an ethical orientation in the midst of malevolence and suffering. And that means, in some sense, and I suppose this is part and parcel of the Christian story, that we have some divine calling. It's something like that. It's like, and that divine calling is to Establish what's good in the midst of what isn't. 
To be and Jesus in the midst of it. To be Christ. Yeah, you, well, you that, well that. then that's the, that. that's right. the question. See, I, I guess I, I, I don't know exactly what to make of that because I don't know to what degree we're called on to find Christ in the middle of that, let's say, or to be lifted up like that in the middle of that. I think it's right. both and. Is yeah, Christ, well, yeah. fair enough. I think so. The Christ, I mean, to the degree, and this is, I think, if I can't, and this is hard, if I can't find Christ in me, then I can't find him in them. And then if I don't see what, what, what he's done, how he's alive in me, then it's, as a priest or as, as a believer, it's hard for me to invite somebody else to that. And it's hard for me to, to see him in somebody else. So that's where I have to first, Paul says, that it is Christ who is alive in me. When I experience that, not just, not just read it. it, it's not just a, a corpus that we look at, that we read the Bible, but it's alive, it's a living word. When that becomes alive in me, then it allows me to be able to see that in other people because, yeah, because well, I know and, me. Well, and I, if I, I see, find him in me, because I know it goes in this head. Well, and you see, you know, when you see people who are noble in spite of their suffering, it is ennobling. It is uplifting. Re like, really, it is. And, um, and it, it's been striking to me, too. People want to be encouraged in that direction. I mean, part of the reason that my lectures, I would say, have been successful to the degree that they have been is because people find them encouraging. Mm -hmm. And that actually seems to work. Like it seems to be positive. Because it, it isn't necessarily good news. Well, it seems to be. Yeah. I mean, it isn't necessarily the case that that would be the case, you know, because it could have been that I would have said encouraging things to people. There's more to you than meets the eye, and you're capable of more than you're demanding of yourself. And, you know, if you took on your responsibility and faced the things that you were trying to avoid, that your life would be richer and better and for you and for everyone around you. And the result of that could have been that thousands of people would come to me and say, you know, I gave that a pretty good shot and it, your advice is really awful and everything <laughs> is, well, seriously, like I took on that responsibility, it just bloody crushed me and I'm way worse off than I was before and everything's gone to hell around me and like, thanks a lot, buddy. And, th that, and that, it's not like that's a completely incomprehensible possibility. But that doesn't seem to be what happens, is what generally happens is that young people in particular, but not only, come to me and say, look, I've been trying to take on more responsibility and to face the things I've been avoiding, and everything is way better. It's like, okay, well, hmm, isn't that something? Maybe and, onto something. Well, then you ask yourself, well, what's the limit of that? Because that's the religious question, fundamentally, is, well, if you took on all the responsibility you could take on, and you faced everything that you needed to face, what would you be like? Who would you be? And how would the world transform around you? And well, if, if the partial answer is, well, if I do that a little bit, things get a fair bit better, then the next question might be, well, what if you did that completely? And I don't think that's possible in some sense, right? It's like, you know, perfection is a horizon that always recedes, but it isn't obvious to me what the upper limit of that is, and certainly we do see people, I mean, saints, let's yeah, that's say. that's what you say, it's a Mother right, Teresa, who, it's a Francis who, of Assisi. Who kind of push the limit, and they, miraculous things happen around them, and maybe in the literal sense, and if not in the literal sense, close enough, you know, for all intents and purposes, and so that's heartening. I mean, I tear myself apart about this in many ways, because I think, Perhaps it's possible to take on too much responsibility and to crush yourself as a consequence. Maybe that's a sin of pride. Who knows? It's certainly possible. But my experience so far has been that when you see people bear their suffering nobly, there's nothing in that but good. That's something. And then when you see people take on more responsibility and decide that they're going to aim up and... and confront their suffering honestly and forthrightly, that their lives get better and the lives of people around them get better too. And so it's, that's very strange as well because it also means that the pathway to less suffering is through suffering, right? And that's kind of, that would be hopeful if the world was constituted that way. It's like, well, there's suffering. How do you make it worse? Run away. How do you make it better? Confront it. Yeah, but it's suffering. It's like, yeah, but it's there. 
there it is, it's right there, it's a precondition for existence or something like that, and it's like you have something important to do as well, and you confront it, and that's the pathway to transcending it. Probably, it's rough. Maybe we wish it would be different, and maybe we don't too.